So good afternoon, everyone. We will now have a talk from Luke Leavis. Yeah. Uh, is it okay for everybody to hear? Yeah. 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 Okay. So we will now have a talk from Luke Leavis, who is group leader at the Jungle Farm. Um, Luke Leavis graduated from a bachelor degree in 2000 at the Oregon State University and he specialized in organic, uh, synthetic organic chemistry. Uh, after four years in industrial research and development at molecular probes, uh, he then went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison where he focused on novel fluorescent tools to image biomolecular trafficking in living cells and he got his PhD in 2008. Uh, he is now a group leader at the Janela Research Campus, where he focuses on constructing novel fluorogeneric fluor tools to enable high-resolution imaging and sophisticated neurobiological experiments. Uh, among his main projects, uh, they, are, they have been tagged molecules that are uh, programmed to glow in the presence of uh, light, enzymes, or other environmental changes, and the synthesis of uh, the new synthesis techniques in order to develop novel dye derivatives. Um, if I shall tell you about my researches on Leuclavis, uh, I would like to, to um, cite this, this quote. Uh, th um, I sometimes call Luke our secret weapon here, says Eric Betzisch, co-worker and 2014 Chemistry Nobel Prize. Uh, so it appears that uh, Eric Betzisch was able to uh, achieve his work on palm thanks to the dyes designed by Luke Leavis. <laughs> that are bright, <laughs> long-lasting and available in multiple colors. And another thing I would like to add is uh, what uh, the article on Nature Made of last uh, October said is that Luke Leavis is a dye center because it disseminates dyes freely to genuinely colleagues in labs around the world. So please, Luke Leavis. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I, I never really know what to do with these long talks at in this sort of venue so i'm just going to mix like some general stuff and then our work and we'll see what happens so um it's really a pleasure to be here uh it's a beautiful place thank you very much for the invitation um so i'm going to start with a commercial for genelia so uh i always get questions about how genelia works and we're actually changing and i wanted to just uh, let you know of a few opportunities. So the background is Genelia is a very, very expensive experiment by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And about 15 or 20 years ago now, they asked the question, what would happen if we built our own research facility, staffed it with scientists from different disciplines, gave them, let's call it more than adequate funding, and then turned them loose on a couple of big problems. So Genelia opened in 2006 in Virginia. It's a really beautiful Virginia summer day. This is typical. Um, we're about 35 miles east or west of Washington, DC. This is the campus here. This is actually the border of Virginia, Maryland. So we're, we're in the extreme northern part of the state of Virginia in the US. We're now the home to around 40 to 45 or so group leaders. There's no teaching, there's no tenure and the lab size is small. You start with two people and you can grow to as large as six, but there's no empire building at Genelia. About a quarter of our group leaders were hired directly out of their PhD, myself included, and that's a model that we've kind of went away from and we're, we're coming back to giving uh, early career people independence as soon as possible. We're fully funded by HHMI, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. We're actually not allowed to write for external grants. It keeps us at the bench and keeps us collaborative. And initially, Genelia was really about imaging and neuroscience. Those were the two main research aims. And we're, we're morphing this now to something we kind of call Genelia 2.0. Um, we're, we're moving to a model where we have a tools hub. We have two tool-centered things, molecular tools and imaging. That's one area. Computation and theory as another area. These are gonna be consistent. Uh, uh, sort of core elements at Genelia. And then uh, we're gonna ratchet around this core two to three biological areas. The first being a 
a refocusing of our neuroscience um, effort, but we're going to have open competitions um, for new biological areas for someone to set up a 15 year effort in some new area of biology. And then we're also, as I mentioned, moving uh, towards um, uh, uh, hiring people, especially early in their career. So if anyone's interested in um, uh, jobs at Genelia, even if you're just a senior gra uh, graduate student, feel free to talk to me. Uh, I thought this audience would, would appreciate this. All right, so um, here's the first question that I just wanted to ask. Why is fluorescence so useful? Why are we all here? And really the answer is that most things are not fluorescent. And so we can put a molecule uh, that is fluorescent in a cell and watch it um, against a sea of billions of other molecules. And of course, we have different excitation and emission spectra. So that gives us sensitivity. This also gives us the ability to do multicolor experiments. Um, there's information that can be encoded in the timing and the polarization of the fluorescent signal. So you can do lifetime imaging or uh, excite with polarized light. There's nonlinear excitation that's possible, multi-photon, two-photon typically. And this yields tight spatial control of your excitation. And of course, uh, we've heard several times now about forced reson resonance energy transfer, FRET, uh, that can be used as a, as a ruler for very short distances and also be used um, in, in parts of uh, sensing uh, uh, strategies. And then uh, fluorescence itself, or fluorophores, I should say, are often sensitive uh, to the environment. And we can read out that change uh, to look at changes in the environment inside living cells or animals. All right, so here's the... I, I added this really quickly, so I think I spelled it right. So the Perrin-Jablonski diagram, as we all know, uh, molecules in the ground state absorb a photon. There's a little bit of relaxation, typically due to solvent reorganization, et cetera. And then the molecules can relax back down to the ground state through emission of another longer wavelength photon fluorescence or through some other process. And a couple of key properties for fluorophores, the absorption max, the extinction coefficient, the emission max, and the fluorescence quantum yield. And um, as, again, has already been mentioned before, the extinction coefficient times the quantum yield uh, is often referred to as brightness. It's sort of a normalized photons, you know, how efficient does a fluorophore absorb uh, photons and then how efficient is it in turning those absorbed photons into emitted photons. Okay, so just getting into the, the multicolor aspect of fluorescence, these are just three different um, uh, absorption and uh, emission uh, traces, and so of course with modern filter sets you can excite these fluorophores uh, separately and then also um, collect the emitted light. And by doing so we can um, do a pretty good job at uh, separating these channels and, and get multicolor imaging. And so this is an example from my lab where we have uh, blue, green, and red signals. Only the red cells are green and so we're able to uh, separate these out in fluorescence microscopy. There are many different types of fluorophores, um, small molecule fluorophores, metal chelates, fluorescent proteins, which we've heard a lot about, and then nanoparticles like quantum dots. In general, I think uh, for biological imaging, um, these two have been the most widely used with flore fluorescent proteins sort of stealing the show for the last two decades. Okay, so just as a disclaimer, I'm gonna talk mostly about small molecule fluorophores but in many, maybe most cases, fluorescent proteins are better and much easier to use because you can just call adgene, they send you a plasmid, the cell is the chemist, it makes the thing for you, and then you don't have to talk to a real chemist, um, which is always a good thing. Uh, and so, um, you know, I'm gonna tell you about a bunch of stuff, but uh, I think in general, you should always start with fluorescent proteins unless uh, you have a very demanding photon intensive um, imaging thing. And I just wanna mention, and I know Roger's name has come up many times, that Roger is sort of the father of us all in many ways because you know, he started out um, working on small molecule fluorophores, developed BAPTA and all the calcium dyes that revolutionized uh, imaging once. And then of course, uh, developed the useful variants of GFP and uh, revolutionized imaging again. And so, um, you know, we're all sort of indebted to his uh, genius. All right, so uh, in this 
plot, I show 30 commonly used fluorescent dyes in biology. This is something I made when I was in graduate school. And I've plotted these uh, fluorophores um, as their brightness, again, the extinction coefficient times quantum yield. And that's against the absorption max of the uh, molecule. That's what each one of these points denote. And then the colors of the emission spectra uh, or colors of the molecules are, are keyed to the emission spectra of the dye. And uh, you know, what this tells us is that there are a large number of fluorophores that span the UV, the visible, and the near-infrared. And as chemists, we can take these molecules and tune and tweak them for different biological applications. And one question that I want to um, answer before we get into some nitty-gritty details is where did we get these fluorophores? Because I think understanding the history, sort of where all these things came from, uh, is important. Um, it's a fun story and it also puts some of the work that's going on in context in, in sort of revisiting these fluorophores. Why were we sort of stuck in a rut for a hundred years uh, in terms of dye chemistry and, and why are we able to do um, cool things even with these uh, rather old molecules. Okay so the story of fluorescence, small molecule fluorophores, and even the instrumentation to measure fluorescence really begins with one compound and that's quinine probably most of you have heard and probably most of you have ingested. Um, and quinine's famous uh, partially because it's an effective anti-malarial treatment. So this is a false color electron micrograph of one of these plasmodium parasites in the gut of a mosquito. Uh, and of course malaria is still a, a problem today, um, but it was a big problem during the colonial age. Uh, and it's actually a natural product from the bark of chinchona trees. And if you were one of these colonial powers trying to gain a toehold in different areas where malaria was rampant, you might think, let's put this stuff in the water. And that's what they did. They made tonic water um, with quinine. And, and actually, tonic water still has a little bit of quinine in it. And this is my favorite tonic water uh, fever tree. And I love this because it says, with naturally occurring quinine, as if we had this huge stock of synthetic quinine. Um, you know, there's probably a few migs of, of this that have, has ever been made in, in the lab. And quinine was actually the first small molecule fluorophore. And the person uh, credited with observing this and writing this down is John Herschel. He was the son of William Herschel, the famous astronomer who discovered uh, a few planets. And uh, John was no slouch. He made important contributions in a variety of different subjects. And in 1845, he published this lovely paper. And I'm just going to read you the title because we don't write titles like this anymore. It's, he says, on a case of superficial color presented by a homogeneous liquid internally colorless. And it's, it's kind of a long paper, but there's one experiment in it. He got quinine sulfate, which you could get in reasonably pure form in 1845. He dissolved it at a fairly high concentration uh, in water. He put that container in the sun, and he noticed this weird blue tinge coming off of the surface of the water. And so you know, he thought that's weird and he wrote a, a lot about what it possibly could be and then uh, that was it. So uh, it sort of percolated in the literature for a few years. And then George Stokes, you get Stokes shift, um, later uh, used uh, this and, and actually worked out the process of fluorescence. He said, this isn't some weird scattering or other effect. It's actually absorption of one wavelength of light an emission of another wavelength of light. New photons are being produced. So he wrote this famous paper on the change of the refrangibility of light in 1852. And because Stokes realized he had uh, discovered a new phenomenon, he thought I can, I can name it. And so this was his name, dispersive reflection. So if this name had stuck, I'd be up here talking about dispersive reflexophores and you would be building fluorescent dispersive reflection proteins or something. I don't know if we would shorten it, but, but no one liked this name, including Stokes. So in a footnote in the same page, he says, I confess I do not like this term. I'm almost inclined to coin a word and call the appearance fluorescence. And that of course is the name that stuck. And so here's the, the legendary Stokes experiment. This is maybe not true, but this is what, you know, what it said. This is how he first determined of this process of fluorescence. He went into a church one day with two things, a solution of quinine in a clear glass bottle, and then a goblet of white wine. And so he used a blue stained glass window as the excitation filter, and the goblet of wine as the emission filter. 
and he showed that if you just observe this light through the wine, you couldn't see anything, it's all absorbed, but there were new photons uh, coming out. And so he knew it wasn't just some weird scattering of phenomenon. And he would later repeat this with a series of colored glasses, a bit more sophisticated um, uh, filter sets. All right, so around this same time, uh, as fluorescence was being discovered, the Industrial Revolution uh, was in full swing. And one of the byproducts of the revolution was uh, this substance called coal tar. This is the stuff that's left over after you extract natural gas or coke from coal. And it's basically a jumbled mix of a bunch of uh, aromatic molecules and other uh, things. And so for a while, chemists had fun studying these aromatic molecules. They would distill them out. They would smell. That's why we call these things aromatic. Um, and then eventually they got tired of that and they thought, well, let's start taking these molecules and trying to make new molecules out of them. And a leading figure in this effort was Van Hoffman. He was president of the Royal College of Chemistry in London, and he's the guy that actually coined the term organic synthesis. And he had a student in his lab, William Perkin, who was 17 at, at the time. This is an older picture. Um, but together they cooked up this idea. They thought, what if we could make quinine um, in the lab rather than making quinine in a tree half a world away. And so this was the attempted quinine synthesis. They thought, let's take an allyl toluidine, we'll oxidize it, and we'll magically make quinine. So anyone who's taken sophomore organic chemistry will recognize that this isn't gonna happen. Um, but remember, they didn't have NMRs back then. All they really had were some simple functional group tests and they had uh, elemental analysis. And so from this, it kind of makes sense. You can take two molecules of this, add some oxygen, and you get the molecular formula for quinine with a water molecule. And so they tried this. Of course, it failed miserably. Um, but for some reason, Perkin thought it would be a really good idea to oxidize aniline. He had a lab in his parents' attic, and he distilled out some aniline. It wasn't quite clean. He was distilling this stuff out of coal tar. He oxidized it, and as he's washing up, he noticed there was this weird purple color in this flask. And so he uh, went and got a piece of silk, realized, oh, this is a colored compound. And you know, before Perkins' discovery, all colored compounds came from nature. Purple was the worst. The best purple dye was this Tyrian purple, this brominated indigo derivative that comes from these spiny sea snails. You have to grind up a lot of snails to get a little bit of this stuff. And so uh, purple had always been associated with riches and royalty. And suddenly Perkin uh, could uh, you know, make a very good purple dye um, out of stuff that he could get for a song. And so uh, he was smart. He promptly dropped out of graduate school and then filed a patent and started a company uh, synthesizing uh, small colored compounds. And this is considered to be really the birth of modern chemical industry. And all of our fluorophores that we still use today, or at least most of them, come out of this initial effort in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So chemists would distill out ar uh, aromatic molecules, use chemistry of the day to make derivatives of these compounds, and then condense these together to make uh, these uh, common fluorophores. Coumarins in 1884, fluorescein 1871, rhodamines 16 years later, phenoxazines and, and um, cyanines uh, were discovered after the turn of the century. All right, I'll just mention that around the 1930s and 1940s, people started getting interested more in drugs than dyes, and so dye chemistry basically morphed in, into medicinal chemistry. I'll just give you two examples. So the first is Paul Ehrlich, who's very famous for basically founding histology, uh, but he also found that this dye, methylene blue, was an effective anti-malarial treatment um, and then more recently, it's been used in photodynamic therapy in cyanide poisoning. Uh, it's also that stuff, if you want to play a practical joke on someone and put this in, a, in their drink, and then this happens. Um, so, you know, when I, I sometimes speak to um, uh, high school students, this is like the one question they ask, you know, can I get some of that stuff? Um, and then really the first synthetic antibiotic came out of dye chemistry, so Gerhard Dalmack. Uh, who won the Nobel Prize in 1939, basically did a screen of a bunch of dyes and found this molecule, Prontosil, which is the first antibiotic sulfa drug. It's actually a pro-drug. This gets reduced in the body. 
Um, and then, of course, uh, these were re replaced by beta-lactam antibiotics. But in general, dichemistry sort of uh, went out of vogue in the 1930s and 40s, and medicinal chemistry ruled the day in terms of organic chemistry um, uh, thereafter. All right, and so just to finish up this story, uh, quinine and malaria would rear its, her rear its head one more time in the development of instrumentation to measure uh, fluorescence, and this was during World War II where the U.S. malaria program um, was founded to uh, find replacement anti-malarial drugs since Imperial Japan controlled the large uh, proportion of, of uh, chinchona tree plantations in Asia. And so the idea was uh, that um, quinine and many of the other compounds would bear this quinoline pharmacophore and it's fluorescent. So we can just use fluorometry to see if these drugs are getting uh, to the blood. And so this effort resulted in the improved dosing of adabrin, this compound which was known, but they couldn't figure out why it wouldn't work uh, in, a, in a human. They found out you have to give them a massive dose, saturate basically the tissue, and then you could back down. And it also uh, led to the discovery of, of chloroquine, which is a commonly used molecule today in many applications. And really before World War II, fluorometers were sort of the lattice light sheet microscopes um, of the world. There were only a few in existence. Um, but they were later commercialized, and now I think probably everyone in this room has a fluorometer or two. Um, okay, so that's where we get all these fluorophores. I'm just going to go over briefly sort of the main classes of dyes, and then I'll go into something uh, a bit deeper. Okay, so in general, uh, for short wavelength dyes, we like coumarins. Uh, so this is the simplest coumarin, 4 methyl umbilepherone. The parent compound is actually found in carrots. So um, that's where we get this umbilepherone uh, name. You can, and this is just going to be general um, for small molecule dyes. Usually th you start out with um, phenols, you go to an amine, you alkylate the amine, and then you rigidify the system. And this improves photostability, and it also uh, shifts the wavelength farther into the red. So here, 360 excitation. Going to an amine, it's basically the same, um, but you get uh, 20 uh, nanometers into the red. And then if you rigidify the system with these jalalidine rings, you buy yourself another um, shift into the red. Okay, uh, another class of fluorophores, these actually were discovered much later uh, during the dye laser days, are the bodipi dyes. These are small lipophilic molecules. Um, and you can tune the spectra here just by putting stuff off of this position. So this that gives you Bodipi TMR, very similar to uh, rhodamine dye. And then if you hang off two things, you can shift uh, further into the red. Fluorescenes are this classic structure discovered in 1871. Fluorescenes and also rhodamines have this interesting equilibrium between an open quinoid form and a closed lactone form. This is colorless and non-fluorescent, and this pays, plays an important role in making fluorogenic molecules, molecules that turn on in response to environmental change or um, uh, in response to enzymatic activity or, or light. Um, you can uh, shift the chemical properties by fluorination. This is a molecule called Oregon Green. And then uh, fluorescenes in general can't be shifted that much farther into the red. You can chlorinate, uh, but that only buys you uh, maybe 10 nanometers. So in general, fluorescenes have, have sort of stayed firmly in the green. Rhodamines are a little bit more versatile. Uh, this is the simplest rhodamine, and then you can alkylate and do other things, as I'll mention later, uh, with uh, this to, to get farther into the red. Phenoxazines are sort of like fluorescenes and rhodamines, but where the pendant phenyl ring replaced with this nitrogen. That nitrogen basically buys you 100 nanometers into the red. So this is a molecule called resorufin, um, and then you can shift it further by uh, putting these in alkyl groups to make a different uh, versions. And these are uh, often used, um, they're somewhat environmentally sensitive, and so they can become uh, quite useful for, for staining membranes, et cetera. And then finally, cyanine dyes. Um, these typically endocyanines, they have these indoline uh, groups on either side of a polymethylene bridge. And then the size of this bridge really determines uh, the wavelength, it's about a 100 nanometer shift for every two carbons. 
and then we count these things one, two, three. This is psi three, psi five, and psi seven. That's, that's basically how the nomenclature goes. Um, I'll just mention briefly flavins and autofluorescence. Why are we always trying to go to the red? I know Robert will mention this uh, too. Uh, but flavin mononucleotide, which was actually on the chart of fluorophores that I showed earlier, is a pretty decent fluorophore, and there's a decent amount of flavin in a given cell. It's this classic paper where they show basically uh, flavins and um, sort of cell extract um, uh, uh, um, uh, emission spectra overlap. And so the vast majority of um, uh, autofluorescence typically comes from of flavins, at least in mammalian cells. And so, oh yeah, redder is better. You remember that way. Okay, so um, there are different applications of fluorophores, biomolecule labels, enzyme substrates, environmental indicators, and cellular stains. And so now I'll go through, I'm gonna talk mostly about uh, biomolecule labels because I'm throwing in some of uh, the work from, from my lab. Okay, so um, one thing that we need to think about is the attachment strategy. How are we actually putting the fluorophore onto the biomolecule of interest. So again, fluorescent proteins are awesome. As has been said many times, they're genetically encoded. Um, you don't have to do anything. The cell does everything for you. And then there's this beautiful autocatalytic uh, chromophore formation that, that makes the fluorophore. The caveats, of course, are that in general, fluorescent proteins have relatively poor photostability, especially when compared to uh, uh, synthetic fluorophores and their brightness can be modest. And the applications for these things are typically live cell imaging and in vivo imaging. In particular in vivo imaging, uh, I think uh, the revolution that we're seeing in, in vivo imaging is really because of fluorescent proteins because it's very difficult to get a dye into uh, an animal. There are of course reactive chemical dyes. Here you take your protein, you have a reactive group on a fluorophore, and you label your protein. The problem is you really can't control in most cases where the label goes and how many you can get on uh, uh, a given protein or biomolecule. Um, so there's, there's that caveat. <coughs> so the benefits are that you can use a wide range of chemical dyes. You can buy a lot of these things. Uh, but there, again, there's a mixture of position and stoichiometry. And then to use labeled proteins in live cells, this typically requires microinjection, which is a low throughput technique. So the applications here, uh, oligonucleotide labeling for fish or antibody labeling for immunofluorescence. And then there are beginning uh, to be these hybrid systems where you combine the benefits of genetically encoded things um, with the specificity of fluorescent proteins. Here you express your protein as a fusion with a tag, uh, these tags uh, typically react specifically and irreversibly with some sort of ligand that you can attach to uh, a uh, small molecule fluorophore. So you just mix these things together uh, and then you get your uh, fluorophore conjugate. Uh, and if this is cell permeable, you can even do this inside a live cell. So the thing is you combine the benefits of fluorescent proteins and reactive chemical dyes, so you, they're genetically encoded. You have that specificity, but uh, you use chemical fluorophores, so you have the nice photophysics of, of dyes. The problem is you also combine the bad things about these uh, uh, stuff. So, so the tags are large in many cases, and it still requires the addition of a, a dye. So you have to talk to a chemist, which you know, can be bad. Um, and the applications here, you can do almost anything uh, in vitro labeling. Uh, so we've done this where you just want to get one fluorophore for protein. Uh, and so you can just mix these two things together, go home, and then you have a perfect fluorescent bioconjugate uh, at the end of the night. Um, and then you can also do this in live cells, as I mentioned, if this thing is, is permeable. Okay, so in terms of classic small molecule fluorophore labels, the first one that really got the field going, this was developed really for immunofluorescence in the 1950s, is fluorescein isothiocyanate, FITSI, which still kind of persists in many uh, filter sets. It's got this amine reactive uh, isocyanate. This has largely been replaced. It's not, the, the adducts aren't super stable with 5-carboxy uh, 
or with, with uh, uh, succinimal esters or NHS esters. And so when you buy stuff from Iberia or molecular probes or Addo tech, and it says NHS or SE, that's what this is. This is an ester that's reasonably uh, stable in water, but reacts rapidly with amines to form uh, stable amines. Another amine reactive uh, derivative is the sulfonyl uh, chlorides. So classic Texas red is just sulforotamine 101 uh, that is treated with a little bit of, of uh, POCl3 and, and you get a mixture of, of the sulfonyl chlorides. Basically all the Texas red that has ever been made was made by this one Polish guy at Molecular Probes who was the first employee and that was all his entire job. So he just spent all day making uh, Texas red uh, sulfonyl chloride. Um, he was a really, really wonderful person. Um, and then in terms of uh, another reactive uh, amino acid, uh, cysteines, there are maleamids here, Michael acceptors for, for thiols, and then also um, iodocetamids, uh, which again react uh, relatively selectively with, with um, thiols, uh, including cysteine residues. So the main ways we label uh, molecules are either with amines or with uh, thiols. Okay, so a lot of the early compounds that were de developed stemming back to the late 1800s uh, weren't that nice. Uh, they were a bit hydrophobic. And so over the years, a number of companies mostly, uh, some individuals have um, optimized these small molecule fluorophores. But at the end of the day, most of the Alexa fluor dyes are just uh, derivatives of these classic fluorophores. And for the Alexa fluor dyes, actually most of them are just rhodamines. So Alexa fluor 48 is just sulfonated rhodamine 110, simplest rhodamine. And then they rigidify, add sulfonates, and then sometimes add these uh, chloro groups here um, uh, for, for different reasons, just to basically tune the spectra for um, specific laser lines. Uh, another caveat here is that uh, even though it says Alexa 48, it does not mean that it absorbs at 488 nanometers. It's actually a bit longer. And so these um, are really just named based on their best laser excitation. And then here are the side dyes, I already mentioned these, uh, where, which are just sulfonated uh, endocyanines. So that's all that Alan Wagner did. Uh, basically, most of the good dyes that we use today are just sulfonated laser dyes from the 1970s um, with maybe a few tricks. Also mentioned that Alexa Floor 647 and Sci 5 are almost exactly the same. It's just where the, rea or where the, the handle for bioconjugation um, hangs off, not here, it's here. Okay, um, a word on these hybrid labeling systems. There are a number of them. So this again started with Roger and his flash system where you can put a very small uh, tetracysteine motif that reacts with a fluorophore that has these two uh, arsenic atoms. You get this exchange and in some cases this can be fluorogenic. Um, you have self-labeling tags, which Kai Johnson uh, pioneered. These are enzyme-based things that have a covalent intermediate. You mutate the enzyme to stop the, en the, the protein at the covalent intermediate, and so you get enzymatic specificity and speed. Um, the cons here are that, the, the, uh, again, the protein tag can be rather large. There are ligases developed by Alice Ting and others. This is a three-component system where you have a small tag a fluorophore and then a separate protein that sticks this on um, here. So uh, this works, um, but because uh, you're asking the enzyme to kind of do a lot, um, you're limited to a, a fairly small number of probes. You can use click chemistry by encoding a non-natural amino acid into the protein. This of course is still a growing area. And then there are these uh, fluorogen activating uh, proteins or other similar systems, these binding motifs that bind fluorogens and then basically freeze out a conformation or change the environment uh, to turn on. And there are a large number of pros and cons for uh, any of these strategies. The, the bottom line is that there's no perfect strategy. It's not like we can just go in and you know, put a protein on a, a uh, uh, or put a fluorophore on a native protein uh, without kind of messing with it uh, in some way. Okay. So uh, I'm now gonna tell you a story from my lab sort of in context 
uh, that deals with rhodamine dyes and some new chemistry that we've uh, developed that ultimately allowed us to uh, make better versions of some of these classic fluorophores. Okay, so I really like rhodamines um, because they're uh, really a nice scaffold for building a wide variety of fluorescent probes. And as I showed you, all most of the alexafluor dyes are rhodamines, which is just a testament to the uh, the fantastic properties of this uh, dye class. So. Um, one nice thing is you can tune the spectra. This is the simplest rhodamine, rhodamine 110, which absorbs uh, blue light and emits this green color similar to GFP. Uh, you can alkylate. You buy yourself a 50 nanometer shift into the red. And if you rigidify, you buy yourself uh, another 30 nanometer shift into the red. Another more modern way to mess with the uh, spectral properties of rhodamine dyes is to replace this oxygen with a carbon or a silicon atom that buys you 60 or 100 nanometer shifts into the red, respectively. You can also make fluorogenic molecules, uh, molecules that turn on in, in response to some stimulus. So if you acylate this nitrogen instead of alkylate, uh, you can cause the molecule to adopt this closed lactone form where this extended conjugation is broken. That interrupts the extended pi system. This molecule is colorless and non-fluorescent. It'll be a white powder if you uh, synthesize this in the lab. But if we remove these ACL groups, in this case, removal of these um, photolabile cages with light, you recapitulate the fluorescent structure. And there are other ways um, to uh, mess with this equilibrium uh, by changing this pendant phenyl ring. You can do a variety of different things, um, again, to make photoactivatable or other uh, activatable uh, molecules. Um, by interrupting this um, extended conjugation and therefore the absorption and fluorescence of the dye. And this open-closed equilibrium is really important even for live cell or tissue labeling because it means the dyes are more or less dynamically amphipathic. They can be both water-soluble as they uh, adopt this uh, zwitterionic form or they can close up into this lipophilic cell permeable lactone form. So you can envision having this in water, it gets close to a membrane, goes in, slips through, and then comes out the other side. And in some cases, we're able to shift the equilibrium a little bit to improve cell permeability, or we can shift the equilibrium a lot and make molecules that are fluorogenic, where they preferentially adopt this uh, form until they bind their uh, cognate biomolecular target. Okay, the problem with rhodamine dyes is that the, the chemistry has been really slow to change. So we're basically, in many cases, still doing the chemistry that was developed in the late 1800s. And believe it or not, there have been actually advances in organic chemistry in the last 100 years. So um, I'll just give you one example of, of how we basically did the same thing for, for well over a century. So this is the simplest rhodamine, rhodamine 110. This is um, the original report. It's this German patent, 1887. Um, so they use Schwefelsauer, I'm probably not pronouncing that right. Um, and then they basically boil these two pieces, this aminophenol and this thalic anhydride at 180 degrees centigrade. So that's the first report in the patent literature. This is the first report in the primary literature. Um, it actually has a structure and they do the same chemistry. Uh, concentrated severic acid, 180 degrees centigrade. If you fast forward 62 years, uh, this is a really nice series of, of uh, Soviet papers um, where they were looking at rhodamine dyes. But again, concentrated sulfuric acid, 180 to 190 degrees centigrade. And then um, here's 52 years later, Chris Chang is doing basically the same chemistry. There's just a carboxyl group for bioconjugation. But again, sulfuric acid, 180 degrees centigrade. So. Um, just so you know, boiling things in sulfuric acid is not the mildest of conditions. And when I used to do this chemistry, my, my pants would get all these holes in them because you know, no matter what you do, there's always spritzes of sulfuric acid that would go everywhere. Um, and so my mother-in-law got really good at repairing my jeans. But, uh, but you know, when I started my lab, we thought, let's, let's try and change this. And, and other people recognize this too. And so I think we're seeing uh, a renaissance in small molecule fluorescent dyes because we're recognizing that we can bring modern chemistry, which was mainly developed for medicinal chemistry, uh, onto these, these classic scaffolds. And so I'll just tell you 
some of the new chemistry that we've developed. So I'll go through this in more detail a little bit later, but we used reduced or leucorotamines, these colorless rhodamines, because they've been uh, reduced as, as synthetic intermediates to make um, photoactivatable fluorophores for localization microscopy, uh, palm. A very useful uh, technique that we developed is taking very simple fluorescein derivatives, making the bistriflet, and then using a modern chemical reaction, a palladium catalyzed cross coupling reaction, uh, to take these easy, cheap fluorescein derivatives and turn them into a variety of different rhodamines. You can use almost any uh, rhodamine um, nucleophile in, in this case. <coughs> now, this works well for fluorescenes, but some of these weird, if we want to make some of these weird rhodamines with carbon or silicon here, we need weird fluorescenes. And so to make these, we've uh, borrowed another modern chemical reaction called the Turbo Grignard, where we basically metallate here and add into this ketone. We can then make this, which then goes into uh, this uh, process. <coughs> the problem here is that this is sort of not matched electronically. This is uh, electron rich and this is electron poor. So um, last year we published uh, another way to make these dyes where we basically just switch the thing around where we can make these dibromides in just a couple steps and then we metallate those and then add in to an ester or an hydride. And that allows us to make these compounds in, in some cases in, in much higher yield and fewer steps. And it also allows us to mess with this uh, pendant uh, ring and basically put almost anything we want there. All right, so um, I'm gonna talk about single molecule imaging techniques. And the, the story uh, that I'll tell you really begins with a, a throwaway collaboration with Bob Tejan, who was the president of HHMI at the time. And Tej had a very simple problem. He said, I wanna look at single molecules as they interact with DNA attached to um, a surface, a cover slip of a RNA a polymerase. And so to do this, he wanted to label using the halo tag, which I've already mentioned. And the problem that Tej had is that there weren't any good red fluorophores at the time with the halo tag on them. So he said, can you make sci-5 halo tag? And so I didn't want to tell Tej this is like two hours of work. So I told him it was going to be really hard. And then a couple weeks later, I gave him some stuff and we published this nice little paper with Tej. But that piqued our interest. And we learned that Tej and many others were doing um, single molecule imaging, not in vitro, but in live cells. Again, using these uh, modern labeling technologies uh, like the halo tag to uh, attach small molecule fluorophores onto proteins uh, inside living cells. And so it's amazing what you can do with modern microscopy. These are transcription factors uh, labeled with a synthetic fluorophore. We're tracking them in three dimensions using this multi-focus microscope developed by Mats Gustafsson, uh, my late friend and, and colleague at Genelia. Uh, but again, here the problem was the dyes. So um, you would use, the, the, at, the, at the time, the only fluorophore with the requisite brightness and photostability and cell permeability was tetramethylrhodamine, this classic fluorophore, again, from this 1887 patent. Uh, it has a modest quantum yield, 41%, and um, it, it, it also is not the most photostable of the rhodamine dyes. So you might think, okay, well, let's use a modern uh, uh, dye, an alexafluor dye. But as I mentioned, uh, the development of the alexafluor dyes involved um, a lot of modification. These sulfonate groups, which is cell impermeant, uh, renders the molecule cell impermeant, rigidification groups to make them brighter, and these, these other things here. So you basically double the molecular weight of the compound. And so uh, uh, even though the, the quantum yield is brighter, um, it just won't work because it won't get inside cells. So uh, we set out to build a better version of tetramethylrhodamine that would have a, a higher quantum yield. And so uh, first thing we did is what's going on with this quantum yield. Um, and if you look at the rhodamines, it actually is a bit of an outlier. So rhodamine 110 has a relatively high quantum yield at 88%. And in prime dimethylrhodamine, 84% quantum yield. Tetramethylrhodamine falls off a cliff at 41% quantum yield. So what's going on here? We think about the process of fluorescence, which we've heard many times, absorption, emission. Of course, that's not the only thing that can happen to an excited state. And so one possible explanation for this is that the molecule can relax back down through a twisted internal charge transfer mechanism or ticked mechanism uh, where you get electron transfer from this nitrogen into the xanthine ring and it twists around this carbon nitrogen bond. 
this intermediate then relaxes back down to the ground state without emitting a photon. So if you think about messing with this, trying to make this um, uh, higher in energy, so you will get higher quantum yield and, and less through this pathway, there are key uh, parameters, structural parameters for promoting or inhibit, inhibiting this uh, ticked state. These include the carbon-nitrogen bond, how much double bond character is there, the ionization potential of the nitrogen, how easy is it to give up an electron, and then any homo-allylic interactions between substituents ortho and alpha, which could predispose the molecule to twist. So we thought about this uh, and, and said, maybe we can just tie back the substituents on the nitrogen into some sort of ring. And, and by doing so, we could control all of these uh, parameters. Okay, we weren't the first people to do this. We and others had made derivatives of tetramethylrhodamine with six-membered uh, piperidine rings or five-membered pyrrolidine rings. And when you look at the spectral properties of these dyes, uh, the lambda max doesn't change all that much. There's a little bit of a redshift. The extinction coefficient is basically the same. Uh, the emission max, um, likewise, the Stokes shift remains constant. But the quantum yield actually varies dramatically based on this a relatively subtle change in structure. So the six-membered ring drops the quantum yield down to 10%. The five-membered ring bumps it up to 74%. So we've tried this dye in single molecule imaging experiments. It's actually not that much better than the tetramethylrhodamine. So we knew we had to go to something a bit brighter. And so we thought about this four-membered azetidine ring. And the problem is no one had ever put an azetidine ring in a 4-4 before. And the reason for that is pretty simple. First, um, if there's one thing people remember from sophomore organic chemistry, it's ring strain. And there are these near 90 degree angles in the azetidine system that just seems incompatible with the planar delocalized system that you need for a fluorescent rhodamine. We thought either this is going to um, pucker and close up into this lactone form, or uh, this will be a, a great target for a biological nucleophile like water or an amine. Now, the other reason no one had ever done this is that we were still using this old chemistry, um, boiling things in sulfuric acid, and this simply doesn't work. The little azetidine doesn't survive these relatively harsh conditions. So we ended up doing this, and the first thing that changed our mind is um, uh, just doing some very simple calculations, uh, just ground state calculations. And we uh, saw that this thing was planar. That surprised us. And when we dug down a little bit deeper, compared um, uh, calculated structures for all of these, we found that this actually had the shortest carbon-nitrogen bond. It had the longest interatom distance, obviously, because of the geometry. And it was known from um, the literature that uh, azetidines have relatively high ionization potentials. So I just want to say this was a special case where calculations actually had some utility um, because we had a good idea of, uh, of um, the, the non-radiative decay pathway of the fluorophore. Um, and so we could just use equilibrium geometry um, calculations to give us a clue. Um, trying to do this on other systems is more difficult. You have to understand the fluorophore or, or do calculations at the excited state, which can be uh, expensive. And then I've already shown you how we solve the chemistry problem. Uh, we can take azetidine, use this cross-coupling approach uh, to put these things on in, in reasonably good yield. Okay, so we did this, and we found to our delight that we, uh, true to our prediction, that we improved the, the quantum yield. We saw a full rescue. We also improve the extinction coefficient. We actually don't know why, but but we'll take it. So um, so we call this dye Geneliofluor 549 or JF 549. And just to reiterate, we took tetramethylrhodamine. We added two carbons net, and we basically improve the brightness in a cuvette by almost threefold. We don't change the spectra all that much, so we just get a shift of one nanometer. Uh, and then we can use our chemistry to basically easily take these um, uh, simple fluorescein starting materials and make, in this case, the halo tag. It works well in live cells. These are cells expressing halo tag histone H2B fusions. If we uh, label with lower amounts, we can resolve individual molecules and get statistics. And JF549 is twice as bright and lasts twice as long uh, than, than uh, tetramethylrhodamine. Get twice as many photons in D-storm type um, localization microscopy experiments. 
<coughs> and this uh, improvement in brightness and photostability enabled some really beautiful microscopy in the early days of lattice light sheet uh, in collaboration with Eric Betzik, James Liu, and Bob Tijan, um, looking at the stable binding sites of SOX2, this transcription factor in live embryonic stem cells. And it was just this hidden brightness that um, enabled us to, to get over the hurdle and, and do these experiments. So this works for rhodamine dyes, but we were curious would it work for other fluorophores. And really because of these uh, old chemistry methods, this dialkyl amino group, dimethyl or diethyl amino groups are found in basically all the, the well-known fluorophores. And so we were curious if, if this would be general. So for uh, coumarins, we get sometimes very large improvements in quantum yield, and this works on a variety of other uh, scaffolds, sometimes not as much as we'd like, uh, but sometimes uh, more than we expect. Okay, so um, as was mentioned before, we give away everything for free, and we don't ask for authorship. And so um, if, if you do that, people will use your stuff, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, and, and so we just started giving away all the halo tag and snap tag, et cetera, um, to everyone. So we've shipped out, you know, thousands of vials over the year. I think last year we shipped out 356 separate shipments of 356 different labs with maybe 10 vials each. So millions of dollars worth of, of compound. Um, and from the initial work, we had two really good dyes. We had JF549, good 550, 560 nanometer dye, and then JF646, a good 640, 647 uh, dye. And they've been used to do single particle tracking of proteins um, in live cells, mRNA in live cells. And because uh, you know it's a small molecule hybrid system, you can do pulse chase experiments where you can pulse with 646, stimulate a spine by uncaging glutamate, and then look at newly synthesized protein at that spine, in this case, beta actin uh, with JF549. Uh, but, you know, biologists get really excited by a new tool, but then they quickly get used to it and they want more. So I started getting emails where people are saying, you know, there are other laser lines <laughs> and you have two dyes. And the problem is that <coughs> the dyes that I mentioned in the earlier slide, this rhodol or this carborotamine, it's going to fall in between 48 and 532 or 594 and, and 633. <coughs> and so, uh, they didn't really match these, these, these laser lines. And what we needed to figure out is a way to fine tune these fluorophores that would be more subtle than lopping off one of these azetidines or changing this oxygen to a carbon. And so in a paper that we published last fall, uh, what we found is you can actually fine tune the spectral properties of these dyes quite is easily actually. Um, the Janelia fluor scaffold is a, is a great way to fine tune uh, because uh, you can buy all of these substituted azetidines at the three position. It's symmetrical, so you don't have any stereochemistry to contend with. And the ring is small enough to where substituents even up here can have some effect on the fluorescent properties. And so we found you can tune uh, by as much as 25 nanometers into the blue. Chemists like to make Hammett plots, so it goes nicely as sigma i, the inductive electron withdrawing uh, character of, of these substituents. And we don't really affect the extinction coefficient. You start to see a little decrease here. Uh, the Stokes shift or the quantum yield, if anything, this goes up. So based on, oh, and the other thing that we wanted to look at is this equilibrium that I mentioned earlier between the uh, closed and open form. The idea is if you can shift this a little bit, um, uh, you can um, make dyes that would be uh, uh, more uh, cell permeable. So. Uh, there's a higher propensity of the molecules to close, a smaller uh, equilibrium constant. And this also goes nicely as sigma i. So based on this, we, we made Janelia for uh, 525. This dye here, it works beautifully in live cells. And then we tested this hypothesis, would it be more cell permeable? So this is a pulse chase experiment. Um, and uh, here's JF549. It takes a few minutes to saturate these live cells, but JF uh, 525 basically saturates as fast as we can do the pulse chase. So even this subtle change, even though the extinction coefficient in water is still very high, um, we see a dramatic improvement in, in cell permeability. So uh, it, we're, we're, we're glad that we can understand this, um, this uh, particular uh, property of the, of the molecule. 
And so based on this, um, we can now uh, sort of fill in uh, these fluorophores. And one other thing that I'll mention is that some of these dyes are fluorogenic. So the parent JF646 shows about a 20-fold increase in absorbance and fluorescence upon binding to the halo tag. This uh, silicon rhodamine uh, fluorogenicity was first discovered by uh, my good friend Kai Johnson. Um, and by tuning now, we can improve the fluorogenicity. So just putting two fluorines here, uh, we get a much larger fold increase. This is um, much more closed, if you would, and colorless. Uh, and even so, you can inject this into a developing embryo um, in a fly. The dye will sort of chill until protein's made, and then you can do single molecule tracking in a developing animal. And then um, we can take the carbofluorescein, which the parent dye isn't fluorogenic at all, and just put four fluorines, and we get an 80-fold increase in absorbance and fluorescence. Um, just to go over briefly the mechanism of fluorogenicity, again, we see this weird thing. What's the deal? Why are these rhodamines different than traditional rhodamines, classic oxygen-containing rhodamines um, that typically are open all the time? <coughs> and so we think it's mainly due to the longer carbon-silicon bonds that stabilize this closed form. And we've started to do some calculations where we see that the delta E for lactinization um, is smaller for silicon rhodamines versus uh, regular rhodamines. So we think it's really just this uh, closed form. It may aggregate, it may not, depending on the concentration, um, but we see now uh, a good correlation between the equilibrium constant of these dyes and um, the uh, uh, fold uh, absorbance and fluorescence change upon binding to uh, different um, uh, targets. Now, why is the halo tag so good at this? Um, so we saw the crystal structure of the halo tag bound to ligand. This is just TMR. And if you zoom in on this structure, you can see that there's a very tight association of the fluorophore. Um, the halo tag ligand actually goes in uh, to the center of the protein where the active site is. And so it lays down on this helix and sort of cracks and twists the dye open. So that, that is how the, the open form is, is stabilized here. All right, <clears throat> now one other question that we've asked is, can we image in vivo? And uh, here is a Drosophila uh, brain, larval brain explant expressing halo tag and these basin neurons. Now, as when I was, before I went to Genelia as a chemist, I would say this is in vivo, but this isn't in vivo, this is ex vivo, um, but this is actually in vivo. So um, this is actually feeding flies, in this case, GF525 snap tag. It's able to reach the brain you just put the dyes in the food. We can do this in mice uh, where we can uh, add um, JF585 uh, in this case, either IP or IV, crosses the BVB and gets to the brain. And then fish are the easiest because you just let the fish swim in some water with the stuff and it gets in and then uh, you can just let the fish swim in some clear water for an hour and, and you're good to go. And this is actually a pulse chase experiment where um, my colleague Monuru is is pulsing during development and labeling different um, neurons according to their birthday. Um, okay, so so we can um, just go through this briefly. We also can make rhodamine dyes for localization microscopy. We've heard about photoswitchable fluorescent proteins. We also, and many of you probably know that under certain conditions you can redox uh, fluorophores. You can also make caged rhodamines. Uh, as I mentioned, um, where you have these photolabile groups that force the molecule to adopt this closed form. Um, the advantages of, of these caged dyes, high contrast because the thing doesn't even absorb light. Uh, rhodamines typically have high photon counts, tunable photochemistry since the cage and the dye are different, and you don't require these uh, strong redox buffers. And in fact, um, in the original Palm paper, there was, there was a supplementary figure with this caged Q rhodamine um, just smeared on a cover slip. And when Eric and Harold went to molecular probes to ask for more, uh, they said, yeah, that was the last vial in existence and we're not going to make any more. Um, and the reason is that the chemistry kind of sucks. And so uh, on, on paper, it's really easy. So this is um, Tim Mitchison's work. It just seems like, oh, you just take this and you take this, mix it together and you're good to go. But if you read the experimental, which is perhaps the most honest experimental in the history of organic chemistry, um, they say things like, 
the reaction generates many products. And the yield that they report isn't a number, it's just poor and variable. So, <laughs> so this is chemist speak for it really doesn't work. You can get maybe a little bit out for a, an experiment, but this isn't gonna be scalable. So the problem is that <coughs> this positive charge is rendering these amines really un in unreactive, so you have to push the, the reaction really hard to get this stuff. So we just ran an end around uh, where we reduce and protect the rhodamine dye with these particular dimethoxy dimethoxybenzyl uh, esters. Now the positive charge is gone because you've reduced the dye, you can isolate, and then in one step you oxidize, remove these protecting groups, recapitulate the dye, and, and you're good to go. And then we've extended this now to redshifted things, slightly modified chemistry. And so these work fairly well um, in uh, cells, just putting them on Floyd and then doing sort of the typical actin uh, palm imaging. You can do two color palms since the silicon rhodamine dye is, is actually a fairly red shifted. <coughs> and then if you add a little bit of, of Trolox, you get really beautiful uh, uh, photon counts um, and a lot of localizations, and this is collaboration with, with Marcus uh, Sauer. And we can make photo other photoactivatable derivatives of the Genelia fluor dyes, borrowing some really beautiful chemistry developed by Stephen Hell, where you make these dyes of ketones. We've now fully characterized this photochemistry. There's actually an initial photochemical step where you get this phenyl acetic acid, and then um, you get a subsequent photochemical step uh, where you get this methyl derivative. Both are fluorescent and stable enough to be useful in live cells. And so I think the major <coughs> use of these is gonna be in these single particle tracking palm experiments where you label your entire population and then stochastically activate a few. Um, but you can also do this with 646, also works on live cells. Um, but it's a decent redshifted uh, thing for palm. All right, so just to finish up the labels, we need more tags. We really only have a few, snap tag, halo tag. They're big, we need them smaller. <coughs> we need tags that are faster. Sometimes you have to label for a very long time. Um, it'd be nice to have cell impermeant, but blood brain uh, barrier ber permeable tags, things that would get to the brain, maybe put on an antibiotic, but not get inside a cell. Um, we need more photoactivatable and photoconvertible labels. And we also need labels that are gonna be compatible with EXM clearing or electron microscopy. Uh, yeah, expansion microscopy is EXM. All right, so enzyme substrates. Just a few minutes left. Okay, so there are a large number of enzyme substrates available. A lot of the most useful ones are based on fluorescenes and rhodamines, and that, again, is because of this open-closed equilibrium. So this is fluorescein diacetate. Um, you can make more stable versions of this, crazy things that only get unmasked by specific uh, esterases. Um, and then you can play with, with uh, ways to, to make these um, only have one masking group instead of two. So this is Tokyo Green. Uh, 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 it's a galactoside substrate. Um, just by messing with this pendant ring, you can cause the molecule to be almost fully quenched just with one group. This is another carbofluorescein derivative um, that is, is masked. It adopts a closed form with just addition of one group. And then uh, there are other rhodamine-based uh, things. And here, to get uh, an enzyme substrate that only requires one masking group, um, you can just modify this bottom ring, make this into a cyclic ether, and you get a high degree of fluorogenicity. Um, one of the main ways that you may encounter enzyme substrates is just a way to uh, deliver dyes to cells. So fluorescein diacetate was discovered by Rotman and Papermaster in the 1960s. You could add this to live cells and then nonspecific esterases would cleave these acetate esters. They called this fluorochromasia or something, which fortunately didn't stick. Um, and this is, is now uh, uh, a common methodology where complicated molecules like this um, uh, calcium indicator can be masked and then unmasked by uh, these nonspecific esterases which are found in most cell types. And these are AM esters, and I'll just mention that of course Roger s also did this, right? He was also uh, the person that put AM esters on the map for delivering small molecules to cells. Um, we've been working on nitroreductase substrates, so 
not just hydrolytic enzymes, but trying to use other enzyme specificity. This is based on old work um, where people found that these compounds had uh, antibiotic activity in the 1950s. We've now made a panel of nitroductase substrates, um, screen them. This nitromidazole is by far the best one. And this allows you to um, selectively unmask molecules in uh, cells that are expressing uh, a, a variant of this nitroductase uh, enzyme. Uh, what we still need, it would be great to have better AM groups that were more water soluble. The dirty little secret is that you have to use a lot of DMSO for many of these things, and that can be a problem. The other dirty secret is, is that every time you cleave a AM group, you release a molecule of formaldehyde, which is not nice. Um, we wanna go beyond hydrolytic-like activity maybe look at enzyme substrates that um, can measure things uh, beyond breaking them apart, specific substrates for measuring endogenous enzyme activity, and then of course we want to make dyes that will work in vivo, and including uh, getting to the brain. Okay, so indicators. <coughs> so I just want to go over briefly sensor systems. You're going to hear a lot about uh, fluorescent protein-based sensor systems. Um, but here, uh, synthetic systems basically involve a fluorophore attached to some recognition motif, and then you get a change in fluorescence upon binding the analyte. So the advantages of synthetic fluorophores, you get many colors, including the far red and more photons. The problems, again, chemists, and, um, and the dyes just go everywhere. The other problem is that you know, we're not that great at, at molecular recognition. So we can really only recognize a few things with um, small molecules really well, uh, well enough to be useful in cells, pH, calcium, voltage, zinc, a few other things. Now on the other side, you have genetically encoded things. Again, all of this is, is gonna be um, peptide-based. <coughs> and the benefit here is that it's genetically encoded, but you have the issues that we all know about uh, with fluorescent proteins. So there are a couple of different um, hybrid approaches. So you can either enzyme activate a small molecule fluorophore. So you have a masked indicator and only where you have some exogenous enzyme, do you get this to work? The nice thing about this is you use established sensors. The problem is the dyes still go everywhere and maybe they're only gonna be activated um, <coughs> in, in a, a, um, a specific cell and there's always background issues. The other way to do this, <coughs> excuse me, is to tether the uh, uh, dye onto a protein using a halo tag. Um, but here again, uh, you can use established sensors, but the dyes still go everywhere. So the hope is like the, the sensor motif will get pumped out of the cells you don't want to. Okay, so in terms of, of synthetic indicators, the two big ones are calcium and voltage. So this is really starts with uh, EGTA, classic calcium chelator. <coughs> Roger found that if you introduce aromatic groups here, um, you could make this molecule called BAPTA, which was a reversible calcium uh, chelator. And then he made molecules like Fura2, which were fluorescent. Um, and then later, I made things like organ, organ green BAPTA1 and the, the flow dyes uh, that were longer wavelength. And so um, in terms of you know, the important properties for these dyes, you have wavelength, the delta F over F, this change in fluorescence over basal fluorescence, the overall brightness of the fluorophore, and then uh, for in vivo imaging, uh, two photon cross, cross section. There are a bunch of different synthetic voltage indicators. The classic ones are electrochromic. They show a very small shift in wavelength, depending on the, the uh, voltage across the membrane. Um, more recent work has involved uh, this uh, DPA, which is motile and can move um, according to the voltage uh, of the membrane. And then you have a fixed um, <coughs> fluorophore, and this serves as a fret uh, quencher. And then more recently, again, Roger and, and uh, 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 Evan Miller developed these um, photoinduced electron transfer dyes, where PET from this molecular wire quenches fluorescence in a, in a voltage dependent manner. Okay, so there are a variety of different sensors um, available. I'm just gonna go over a couple enzyme activated and tethered. 
So we were able to make a derivative of flow four, we call flow four XL, it has this extra carboxyl group. And then we masked it with these nitroreductase things. And so the top fluorophoric portion is unmasked by nitroreductase, the bottom by uh, esterases, just with standard uh, AM acetoxymethyl esters. And so we can get specific delivery of this uh, calcium sensor to genetically defined subsets of cells. So the red cells are expressing the nitroreductase, uh, the blue cells are not, and only the red cells um, are responsive down to one AP, one action potential. Okay, um, for tethered stuff, we wanted to make a semi-synthetic um, tethered version of super ecliptic fluorine, which people will probably mention later, this pH sensitive version of GFP that is quenched at vesicular pH 5.6 or so, but upon vesicle fusion uh, becomes highly fluorescent. So we thought, can we find a dye that is colorless and non-fluorescent at pH 5.6 and colored at, at pH uh, 7.4? And um, this was really based on early uh, work with um, fluorescein. This is the canonical small molecule pH indicator. And um, the problem with fluorescein is that uh, it doesn't really become quenched at low pH. Uh, it just becomes a little less absorbing and a little dimmer. And the pKa is a little too low for these experiments. But in our work on making carborhodamines, we found that this carbofluorescein actually shows a cooperative transition to a colorless non-fluorescent form and a higher pKa. And so you can see this in pH titrations, a steeper slope, <clears throat> you can also see this by eye. This is carbofluorescein at pH 5.6. It's, it's completely colorless. So this works in cells. We can just add the snap tag uh, ligand of this to cells expressing the snap tag um, construct in, in these vesicles. They flash. It's roughly the same as the super ecliptic fluorin, um, but it's red shifted. And then the other cool thing is you can make a completely synthetic um, uh, fluorine type thing by just attaching this derivative, which we call Virginia orange. It's the redshifted analog of Oregon green uh, onto an antibody for synaptotagmin. You just sprinkle it on your cells and you get these very large uh, transients uh, from this thing without any genetic manipulation. So one thing that we've been working on, and I think this may become important as we move to more sophisticated uh, uh, difficult biological experiments is something that we're referring to as chemigenetic uh, sensor design. And so the idea here <coughs> is unlike a tethered system where the protein just serves to capture a uh, small molecule um, uh, sensor, here we want to genetically encode the sensor motif. And now we just have to deliver a dye um, and then the environment around the dye changes. Um, but the nice thing here is that you only have to deliver a dye, which we can do, and the protein does all the hard stuff. Um, now the challenges here is a, it's a completely different uh, biological or a protein engineering uh, problem. All right, so this is just our first attempt, a chemigenetic voltage indicator. This is based on purely genetically encoded voltage indicators um, that use this electrochromic threat mechanism. They're usually an opsin attached to a, a fluorescent protein like amnion green, you get an absorbance change as the membrane depolarizes with the opsin that causes a increase in fret and a little dip in the signal. So we thought let's just change out the FP with the halo tag, and in this case, uh, Geneliofluora 549. Um, so this is an initial attempt. We've actually improved the membrane trafficking, um, but this is the sort of signal that you get it's relatively fast and modest delta F over F, maybe minus five to 10%. So this isn't any better in terms of signal to noise than you would get with a fluorescent protein. But what you do get is an increase in photons. So this is actually a bleaching curve of uh, ASAP1, this GFP based indicator. Um, this is the bleaching curve of amnion green. <coughs> probably one of the best in class um, voltage indicators. And then it's a little hard to see here, but this is what you get with the Gen Genelia 4 549. So it's five to 10 times brighter and maybe five to 10 times uh, more photostable. This is under uh, equivalent uh, imaging power. 
the other cool thing about these systems is that they're modular. So you can add different dyes, they all work. The signal really depends on the overlap of the absorption of the opsin. And because it's a bunch of colored things going into a black thing, we call it Voltron. Um, and what, <coughs> oh, and I, yeah, and, and I don't, <coughs> for time, I don't have the slide, but um, we've done this now, population imaging in both the fish and the mouse, and we can do, you know, 50 cells for 15 minutes at uh, 500 hertz imaging. So uh, this uh, improvement in photostability is, I think, going to open up this field of, of in vivo voltage imaging. So what we need, we still need far red and near infrared calcium indicators, and Robert is uh, crushing that. Uh, we need uh, neurotransmitter and neuromodulator sensors, better targeting of functional indicators, and I, I, I'm excited about this chemigenetic approach uh, because I think it's going to open up um, uh, a new realm of, of biological imaging. Okay, so <coughs> in the last two minutes, um, I'm just going to talk about stains. So, you know, there are a ton of stains out there, and you just kind of have to try them. Um, there are nissel stains. Nissel is basically RNA. Crestle violet is a classic one. This oxazine A that we've made is also halfway decent. These are just positively charged things, and they bind negatively charged nucleic acids inside cells. There are DNA stains, DAPI, amine bromide, Huxt. And there are, of course, membrane stains like Nile red and dye eye, and there's a variety of different dyes. And there's also you know, things for ER, mitochondria. These are things that you can purchase and you just have to try. Sometimes they work really well. Sometimes um, there's a lot of background. Now, one uh, thing that stains are useful beyond just standard cellular imaging is a, another super resolution microscopy technique called PAINT. Stands for points accumulation for imaging in nanoscale topography. It's weird because Robin Hofstrasser published this in 2006, the same year as all the other super resolution microscopy things, and it sort of got forgotten. Um, but it was that same year that all the other uh, localization microscopy work was being done. So we've been working a little bit on paint. Um, and we, we basically can find stains two ways. We screen for them. So we found this azepane containing rhodamine actually is a fantastic stain for internal membranes inside fixed cells, which is what you need for this long imaging. And then we've also found that you can attach JF dyes to Huxt and um, uh, get, in this case, AT-rich selective uh, uh, DNA stains that are uh, modestly fluorogenic. Okay, so um, together with Eric Betzik, we can use the lattice light sheet microscope to scan through a volume and do paint. And so you can see a bunch of molecules moving around, we throw those away, we can localize the individual molecules. This is this beautiful picture of uh, the lattice. You can do this serious, uh, serially, so you can paint um, DNA, you can paint membranes, and you can interweave the standard palm. I'll be honest, when, when Wes Legant, who was the postdoc in Eric's lab, and, and John Grimm and I, postdoc, or a senior scientist in my lab, started doing this, there's all this crap from the DNA and the cytosol and so we made a bunch of different derivatives trying to get rid of this. And then finally, we, we realized that it was just the mitochondrial DNA because it fits into these little holes in the membranes. Um, but this is the sort of imaging that you can get. It's a fun movie. Again, the nuclear membrane are the lamins in yellow, um, purple DNA, and then the membranes are cyan. So you can see the tubular mitochondrial structures and uh, this web-like ER. Okay, so what do we need? We still need better membrane stains. Uh, the things that we have just often don't have the right um, specificity. There's too much background. One way to get that is to make fluorogenic stains, stains that only turn on when they bind. Most of our stains target um, biopolymers or specific uh, compartments. It'd be nice to target endogenous proteins. And we're still limited in many cases to um, uh, just a few colors of stains. All right, so um, just to end, you know, the beauty of chemistry is that we can make almost anything. Um, but just because we can make almost anything doesn't mean uh, that it's useful. So um, chemical probes can be very difficult to use. So 
you should use fluorescent proteins wherever possible. Um, but I do think that this idea of combining the flexibility of small molecule synthesis with genetics is a very powerful one and will continue to be uh, in the future. So um, I just want to acknowledge a few people. So here's the lab. The current members are underlined. To be honest, most of the chemistry that I showed today was done by one person, this amazing chemist that I poached from Merck. And then we work with a large number of uh, collaborators, both inside and outside Genelia. And of course, all of our funding comes from Hughes. So thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you very much for this nice talk. Are there any questions? Thanks a lot for your talk. Uh, uh, since you were mentioning a lot about rhodamine, uh, rhodamine have a DNC, delocalized lipophilic cation uh, mm -hmm. characteristics uh, that act, uh, I don't think it's, oh, oh, that's, on. Oh, that's working. Yeah, that uh, as mitochondria targeting uh, a probe, but uh, it does not have a long lifetime that uh, might help us in ROS detection. So mm -hmm. is there any suggestion for longer lifetime or? So do you mean longer lifetime in terms of photobleaching time mm -hmm. or? No, in fluorescence. Fluorescence lifetime. Fluorescence lifetime. Right, so I didn't mention anything about lifetime. Exactly, this is what I was. <laughs> yeah, so I mean the lifetime of most of these dyes is gonna be like four nanoseconds tops, right? Exactly. So there have been a few other examples of of dyes with longer lifetimes, but in general, I think small, mo these yeah. we were, al were always sort of limited. Um, by four nanosecond lifetime. We thought like uh, because it has very small uh, lifetime to tether uh, them with another molecule such as pyrene, butyric acid. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But the problem is that uh, it did a quenching for the py pyrene uh, butyric acid. Uh, it has like a long lifetime of 300 nanosecond. Mm -hmm. And when we tether them to rhodamine, uh, uh, rhodamine acting as a targeting uh, cargo transport model for this, uh, for uh, pyrene butyric acid, but uh, the lifetime of pyrene just dropped too much. Oh, right. That is not working yeah. as a ROS detector. Yeah, no, I think the problem is that, you know, the measurement of fluorescent lifetimes is hard. So it's not something we generally do, right? That's not a piece of equipment that you can have in the lab. Yeah, I mean, there, there have been other examples of lifetimes in the tens of nanoseconds with these DOTA type dyes and other things, these sort of things that look kind of like rhodamines. Um, but yeah, getting anything longer, I think, is going to be difficult in a small molecule, um, uh, uh, like a so of with one of the the sort of standard small molecule dyes that we we typically use. It's just it's a hard problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's actually just like uh, s uh, searching for uh, a rigid combination between them instead of leaving them because as we saw that rhodamine is planar, mm -hmm. so they would just like fold back and do the mm -hmm. quenching uh, stuff. Yeah. Rigid connection. I don't know oh what yeah. is it. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. No, that's another. That's an interesting idea. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah you should try that. Yeah. Thanks. I have a general question about this photostability issue mm -hmm. because I think we all uh, accept the idea that organic dyes are more photostable, a lot more photostable than fluorescent proteins. But then, I got confused many times when reading this abstract from a famous nature paper by Nathan Schanner and mm -hmm. um, with Roger Tien as the corresponding author uh, about engineering of more photostable fluorescent proteins. And in this abstract, it's written like, although fluorescent proteins typically bleach at substantially slower rate than many small molecule dyes, Blah blah blah. We want to improve fluorescent proteins even mm -hmm. to get. So what? What is this about? Uh, <laughs> it is because <laughs> these guys know what they're talking about for sure. Yeah. And so I'm. Um, I still remain confused about this uh, this issue. Could you right. please comment? Yeah. So. I mean, maybe they were comparing. Maybe they were comparing it to fluorescein, which is not the greatest small molecule fluorophore. We've done side-by-side -side comparisons, both bulk in, in cells and also single molecule imaging experiments with M neon green. And, you know, Genelia 4514, the, the data that I showed holds there. It's substantially brighter. 
and substantially more photostable. So we, you know, that that's sort of the litmus test, right? You can get the number of photons per molecule and get a bunch of molecules. So in general, I think uh, the rhodamine dyes do have higher photostability than most fluorescent proteins. So I don't know what they were. It was a typo in the abstract. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, Robert. Yeah. Yeah. Just using the base dyes always. Can we forget about the methane and the other that could be pretty helpful? Yeah. Yeah, I mean I yeah. I mean in the in the sense like even our dyes are not the the alexophore dyes in many cases are way better in terms of photostability. The thing that with our dyes is that they're self permeable and so that's why, you know, they're interesting and useful. But yeah. But yeah. I mean, I can show you the single molecule data because we freak out because because we th we think we're doing something wrong because our cells are ten times brighter, and and then we went to single molecule just to make sure we weren't seeing any weird expression or anything. So yeah, it's substantially brighter. Yeah. yeah. yeah so um, that was a really beautiful lecture and giving great overview. So and and you optimize so many things to to specific things and 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 the and the. Photo stability issue. Coming back to that, you you also optimize it, but not mm -hmm. specifically. So you were not looking what was right. the reaction you need to block. Like there's always a specific reaction that kills yeah. the dye at the end of the day. So did you work specifically, like see what is the reaction I have to block, and and I put another group there. Mm -hmm. So we have tried this. Um, I don't think I have the slide in this deck. So so in the end, we we improve. So so the the problem is that we don't know a lot about the photobleaching mechanisms of rhodamine dyes, or even fluorescein. We don't know the photobleaching of fluorescein, right? So there's a famous example. Roger apparently put Ziploc bags of fluorescein on the roof of the building in San Diego, and then forgot about them, I guess. And then asked Stephen Adams like two months later to HPLC the brown crap that was in these bags to try and see what was going on. So we need to redo those experiments. Um, now, the, in the one thing we do know from um, the laser dye field is that the initial photobleaching mechanism of an alkylated rhodamine is dealkylation, and it goes through an ionization at that nitrogen. So we think, you know, both our ticked hypothesis, that's an ionization at that nitrogen, and the initial photobleaching go through this, as editing has higher ionization potential. That's why we were able to improve both the brightness and the photostability. We've tried a variety of other things, some rational, some not, and we can get eke out some improvements in the, um, in the uh, photostability of these dyes. Uh, but, but right now it's still empirical because we don't know what, we only know that first step. And so that's what we're trying to block. We don't know the subsequent steps. We don't know what happens after the dealkylation. So it's, it's still a work in progress. It's the, sort of the next frontier because we can't improve the brightness very much more. Um, so we have to improve the photostability. If we think about uh, another difference between mm -hmm. the fluorescent protein and uh, the chemical dyes, I think the uh, difference in the, uh, the rotational mm -hmm. uh, Sorry, the rotational relaxation can be different. So do you have any idea about the anisotropy in the case of the free dyes? And also, in the case you are going to use the fr free dyes as a labeling, actually this makes the fusion protein, a uh, fusion to the proteins. Then I guess in that case, the, the diffusion or rotational diffusion can be slowed down. So mm. Do you have any idea about this? <coughs> right, so in general, if you're doing anisotropy, most of the time, you can you can assume that the dye is sort of moving more or less freely. It sort of, you know, in theory, it moves like a cone, and so it can have there's so it can sample a lot of different positions. <coughs> I will say though, on some of these tags, where there's a very tight association of the dye and the protein, we do run into some of these problems. Uh, especially, this is a big problem in FRET, right, where um, now you've got a dye that's on the surface. It's not buried in the middle, but it is rigid. And so um, it won't be able to sample different conformations. And so s in some cases, FRET has been difficult, especially with the halo tag. The snap tag, which has uh, a less association, it seems to tumble a bit freely even on the surface of the protein. So yeah, it's a consideration and something we're, we're dealing with because people want to do 
a single molecule threat with some of these things, and they're finding it hard to see a threat signal because uh, it's, it's sort of in, you have to try a bunch of different linkers and different positions on the protein with the with the halo tag in particular. Thanks. Yeah. So what's the highest quantum yield ever uh, reported for a, for a dye? And what's the physical limit? Well, the physical limit is one. No, 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 yeah, yeah, but yeah. what's yeah. the practically? Oh, so <coughs> it depends. So we found dyes that have quantum yields of 0.95. And that is, I mean, you know, I guess it, you know, like what's the physical limit? Are you saying at room temperature? Um, I mean, in, in water, I would assume that you're probably going to lose 5% through some vibrational thing. So, you know, we're, we're probably near the top. I mean, you can certainly get quantum yields near one, um, you know, in, in cryogenic temperatures or in some solvent or something like that. Um, I, will, I will say that, you know, with fluorescence, we used to do fluorescence quantum yield measurements using a reference. And then we got one of these um, uh, integrating sphere systems. And the, the values are different. And even the values on some of the references are different. So you have to be careful. When we bought the system, we, we did all the reference dyes. And even fluorescine in water, the, the value we get is a little bit lower. Um, so you know, the, the problem, the reason I say that is there's, there's a, a certain degree of error in all of these measurements too, maybe plus 5% at best. So, um, so you know, if you're getting around 90%, you're probably near the near the top that you, uh, we can get. But I don't know if there's a physical, I don't know if of you know an equation where you can get like oh five percent is going to go through some thermal process. I don't know. Yeah, but one is the top. Yes, I would I would certainly agree with this. One is the is the top is the basically the definition for an isolated molecule, single molecule. Mm -hmm. So, but as you emphasized in the beginning, I think the most important data is the brightness. Mm -hmm. So if you uh, imagine you, you enhance your e absorption coefficient by a factor of 10, mm -hmm. it's much better than gaining 10% of in quantum yield. So that's one thing you have to think about yeah. in, uh, in, in fluorescent but as probes. But, you know, as Fabian said, the... Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the top later. of the extinction, you know, in, in theory, based mm -hmm. on, you know, oscillator strength, you mm -hmm. know, our, our extinction coefficients are kind of at least in the range of, of max, right? And so we can, we can try and determine the maximal thing. They're usually 150,000 at best, right? So I'm, I, I would love to be able to, to get dyes that would absorb 10 times more light, but I'm not sure if, if that's just, yeah, if it's, if it's feasible. Yeah, I mean, exactly. There's not enough space, right? Yes, yeah, yes there's exactly. Not That's a literal size. cross section. Pol yeah, yeah, yeah. Porphyrin have, have higher of 10 to the 5 or. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, so we're at, we're at, yeah, we're at 10 yeah. to the 5, yeah. And coming back to the, to, the, to the comparison between fluorescent dyes in water mm -hmm. or in aqueous media and uh, fluorescent protein, I think we can, uh, we can compare only one dye into a fluorescent protein and, and the same dye into uh, aqueous media. That's where the comparison stand stands. And I think that from this general point of view, we can say that uh, photostability can be improved for, our si for the same dye in the fluorescent protein based on its environment. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of protected, to, to say it very mm -hmm. simply. And second, as it was mentioned, because it's increased rigidity for fluorescent protein, you can then gain on the fluorescence quantum yield because you decrease rotational mm -hmm. uh, the, the activation and so mm -hmm. on. So that's basically, uh, so that's why some people say this is more stay photostable. And of, of course you can say rhodamine are more photostable, but you cannot put so easily rhodamine into a fluorescent protein. Right. Yeah, no, I will I say. I mean, we like yeah, a we fluorescent yeah. protein, totally in case mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah, yeah. No, and obviously we're obviously comparing most of the time we're comparing this in a cell. So it's yeah. halo tag labeled with a rhodamine dye, and then the same fusion with a fluorescent protein. So that it's, it's as good as we can get, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's not just in vitro measurements of free dye and, and other stuff. OK, any more questions? No?
So, did you have any phototoxicity uh, in this uh, so rhodomycin? Like, uh, I mean, like uh, when we have an increase in quantum yield, uh, so uh, does this rhodomycin uh, produce uh, this uh, uh, reactive of uh, oxygen species inside cells? I mean, yeah. So I think all dyes do. We've tried really hard to measure the contribution of the rhodamine dyes. Um, the problem is that light itself is phototoxic. And so normally what we see is if we have a cell and then we label it with a halo tag, there's a, the light itself is phototoxic. So we're able to see, you know, maybe a little increase, but it's not statistically significant. So it's been hard. We've been searching for this. We've been trying to quantify how bad these fluorophores are in terms of phototoxicity. And the background from just general phototoxicity can be quite difficult or quite high, so it just doesn't doesn't work that well. Yeah, so they we do see some generation of singlet oxygen, et cetera, in vitro. So they are doing stuff. We have new derivatives that actually don't show any singlet oxygen, which is kind of weird. But we're not sure if they're going to be useful because, uh, in general, these this rock seems to be kind of in the noise. Yeah, you can buy them. You can buy the NH assessors from Tokris. Um, but the halo tag stuff, just call me or email me. No, I, I mean, like I really sent out like 10 shipments today and my lab coordinator did. I was I was doing email, writing people back and, and doing this. So yeah, yeah, we have a whole system. We have SDS sheets in multiple languages. It's really fun. Yeah, people write us and are like, that thing's in German. This is amazing. So yeah, yeah. So um, yeah. Okay, if there are any more questions, so thanks again. Right. And we will now have a break before the welcoming drink.